Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. Our first reading today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord God came to him, This man shall not be your heir, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count all the stars if you're able to count them. Then he said to them, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned him it to be as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from Luke's gospel. We are walking with Luke all the way through Lent this year. Today we are in chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. This is Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. Luke 13, 31 through 35. Listen for the word of the Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today and tomorrow and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in 2013... The song that made its way up the Billboard 100 to number six was a song called, What Does the Fox Say? It was kind of a novelty, a silly song by a Norwegian comedy duo named Ilves, Y-L-V-E-S. I think they were just playing around and somehow, as things do every once in a while, it stuck. It was kind of a synthetic dance thing. The video became all the rage. And as of March 2019, that's this month, 850 million YouTube views for this silly little song. Now, the song concerns itself with what a fox says. Anybody ever heard a fox? I don't know that I have. I'm pretty sure they haven't. The opening stanza simply goes through several different animals and the noise they make. The dog says wolf, the cat says meow, the bird says tweet, the mouse says squeak, and on and on through different animals until they get to the chorus, which then loudly proclaims and asks the central question of our morning, what does the fox say? And in the song after that, 
It's just a bunch of gibberish and nonsense because there's not really a word that makes the sound of what the fox says. Today in Luke's gospel, we are concerned with what the fox says. Well, let's back up a little bit. We are in the 13th chapter of Luke's gospel. Again, walking with Luke throughout Lent, which is our six-week period of preparation for Easter, the events of Holy Week. There's a time where we look inside ourselves, where we reflect, we repent, we try to target those behaviors that keep us from God. That's the giving up and the taking on at times. It's why we are asking you to do something different and new, different ways to be with God, whether that is serving others, whether that is scripture, whether that is prayer in groups by yourself, however you do that, that is at the heart of this journey so that we will make room for Christ in new ways in this six-week period. And then again, we'll be able to walk with Christ even more closely through the events of the last week of his journey, of that part of his journey. So in the 13th chapter, we're more than halfway through Luke's gospel. Jesus now starts to set his eyes towards Jerusalem. He knows where he is heading and what will happen. So he's just finishing up talking to a crowd on the mountainside with Pharisees, with other gathered folks who by this time have seen some miraculous things, some healings, some miracles. Something's going on with this peasant woodworker who is claiming that he is the son of God or others are claiming that he is. So he's starting to generate a following, which then is starting to threaten the leadership structures of the Jewish church and the Roman uh, occupation, the Roman army and government, even more so. So after he talks about his parables and he's teaching, kind of right in the middle, some Pharisees speak up and said, Herod wants to kill you. You better go. You better go take refuge. Herod is coming after you. Now, we know We've got a couple of Herods we need to talk about, just two really for this conversation. Herod the Great was the one who was the Jewish king at the time Jesus was born. He was the one that was met with the wise men, if you remember, and said, oh, there's a new king of the Jews. I'm the king of the Jews. Tell me where I may find this child that I may honor him. Well, the wise men were told and knew better. They went home a different way. Herod went crazy, killed all the two-year-olds and under in Bethlehem to try to kill this newborn king that would threaten his stature and power and title. So that's Herod the Great. Now we are at a, with Jesus in his adulthood, getting ready to be in the time of his crucifixion that this Herod Antipas plays a role in. This is his son. Herod was not seen by the people as a faithful or courageous leader. The Romans didn't even give him the same territory that his father had. He was called a tetrarch because he only controlled a fourth of that territory, but it was Jerusalem, which is a pretty big deal. That was the hub, the center, the temple. And so these Pharisees, and again, the Pharisees, the relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees is often a rocky one. Jesus beats them up pretty good all the way through the Gospels, but we don't know their intent here. There were probably also Pharisees that were sympathetic to Jesus. We know Nicodemus, early in John's Gospel, is a Pharisee and came to Jesus even, although it was at night, so no one would know, he was a supporter of Jesus. There were probably others. So their action of warning Jesus because Herod's coming after him could have been for his own good or... They could have been setting a trap to try to get him to run and then be caught by other powers and principalities. We don't know. It doesn't really matter in the bigger picture. So they say, you better go. Herod's coming after you. And Jesus says, you tell that old fox. You tell that old fox, which was not a term of endearment. Jesus was not calling Herod good-looking in any way. He was 
calling him sly, conniving, devious. You tell that old fox that I'll be here today and tomorrow and I'll take care of my business on the third day, buddy. Don't you worry. Third day, we can't help but connect that to Easter, the end of Jesus' earthly mission at that point. Although he will resurrect and be seen, there's that portion. But it's all about Easter and the resurrection for us as Christians. So he says to Herod, hey, I've got work to do. I don't have time for your nonsense. I've got work to do today, tomorrow. On the third day, I'll finish my business as you know it. And nothing you do will stop me. You are an insignificant like the buzzing of flies to me. And then he continues on to his view of Jerusalem and weeps and laments. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how you have killed those that God has sent to you, meaning the prophets, to try to bring them back into relationship with God. How you stoned them and killed them. And if you had just accepted them or me, as Jesus looks toward the cross already, He intimates that this may have been avoidable if you had just believed and followed and not run the other direction. All of this may be for naught, but I weep for you, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I seek to welcome you in as a hen gathers her chickens under the protection of her wings. Wow, that's kind of a compassionate response. Jesus would have every right to say to them, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stiff-necked people, this is your fault. You turned away from everything that God did for you. You shunned every person I sent your way to be my messengers. You deserve whatever happens to you, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I weep for you, but you're going to get what you deserve. Would have been in his rights. They, as we, have earned our punishment. But Jesus doesn't go the God of wrath way. He goes the way of compassion. And says, oh, that I would long to welcome you in like a mother hen does her brood. That is compassion. There's a story about a young man who used to spend time with his grandfather who had a chicken coop. One night, a storm comes through, lightning strikes the coop, the hen house, burns it to the ground. When it is safe in the morning, he goes out with his grandfather. The hen house is burned to the ground, and he sees the hen outstretched feathers, singed, dead. The grandfather goes to pick up the dead hen, and out from underneath it scurry four little chicks that were kept safe under the wings of that hen. Jesus makes this direct correlation and says, I long to do for you what that hen did for her brood. If you would just believe in me, if you would just follow, Jesus says, I will stretch out my wings and protect you and bring you home. That is the good news of the gospel. But we got that old fox. He's got a voice in this as well. Herod represents those voices of the world that tells you that in order To live a successful life, it is all about us. It is all about how much we make, what we wear, what we drive, the the status, the power, the respect at any cost, no matter how we achieve it. The voices of the world that Christ came to say is not my voice. I bring another voice, a voice of love and compassion and grace Yes, one that has judgment as a part of it, one that convicts us in our shortcomings, but one that ultimately forgives and loves us. Our challenge today 
is to look at those two voices. Will we be the voice of the fox that speaks of what the world says is important? Or will we be the voice of that hen, the voice of our risen Christ? That is one of compassion and reconciliation. In order to hear that second voice, that voice of Christ, that's the harder voice to hear if we're not looking and we're not listening. That other voice is there day one we come into this world and lasts until we are done. It surrounds us in everything we do, our schools, our places of business, all the media, the news, the politics, all of it reeks of Herod's and the fox's voice. It is this other voice that we seek, that we are seeking to cultivate, that it may transform us, but we have to see the value in it. And we need to be open to believing. And if we believe, taking that next step of depth. We only have one risen Savior, and there's a reason he came to be with us. There is a bishop that tells the story of before, way back in the day, before cell phones, there was a child, a a boy who went to his doctor. He was hemorrhaging internally with some virus that the general physician could not identify, could not figure out how to help this young man. He said, but I I can't do this. I don't know what to do, but I know who does. Got on the phone, called the guy two cities over. He says, I know you're a specialist. I can't help this young man. His life literally hangs in the balance. I need you to get here ASAP because you can save him. The specialist says, I'm in, I'm on it. Gets in his car at his first stoplight in his town, two towns over. A man in a gray cap and a brown leather jacket comes up to his window, puts a gun at his head and said, get out of the car. And, and he says, oh, oh, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. I have to go to the, get out of the car or I'll shoot you where you sit. Man gets out of the car, throws him down, takes his car, gone. Well, again, pre-cell phone, what did we ever do? He tried to go to some nearby homes, knocked on five houses with nobody there, finally got to the sixth, and time is ticking, and he knows it. He finally is able to get to the phone and call a taxi, pre-Uber, and it came to him and picked him up and said, buddy, I need to go two towns over. And the cabbie said, I can't. I can't leave this area. We're local. We can't go there. But I can take you to the bus station. You can get a ticket and ride the bus. He says, I'll ride if it's what I have to do. He goes, finally gets there two hours later. The doctor, general physician, meets him in the parking lot and says, I don't know what's going on, what took you so long, but the boy died 20 minutes ago. And he said, I'm sorry, you would never believe what happened. He said, I'm sure, I'm sure. But I need you to come with me and talk to the family. They are distressed and distraught. They are barely hanging on. So they go into the waiting room, and he recognizes the father right away with the gray cap and the brown leather jacket. It was he who took the one man who could save his son's life and threw him aside in his haste to get to the hospital. It's exactly what Israel did in that time. They were looking for a Messiah. Their understanding was that it would be one that would come with great power and might with an army to overthrow Rome, get these occupiers out of the house, not some poor woodworker who can do a few miracles. That's not the Messiah they were looking for. And so they rejected him. And in doing so, just like in the story, they rejected the one person that could save them. Our lot is the same. We have to cut them a little bit of of slack because they didn't know the ending at this point. We do. 
They hadn't been through the resurrection with Christ, yet we have. And we still fight the same battle that they did in fully welcoming Christ into our lives and hearts. This is the time for us to seek that kind of acceptance. The story by Anne Lamott, writer, Traveling Mercies, just one little section. By the time she was 30, her life was a mess. She grew up in a mess, chemically addicted, all kinds of dysfunctions. She found herself alone in a room in a medical emergency in a drunken stupor. She was on the floor when she felt and knew that there was a presence there with her that she attributed to Christ. There was no other way that that could have been anybody else in her recollection. And about a week later after she was recovered, she stood up and she screamed, expletive, I quit. You can come in now. That was her conversion moment. As if to say, I can't fight this anymore. I can't pretend like I don't believe. I can't pretend like you're not there. These defensive, messy walls that I put up to try to kid myself that you're not there, the time is over. I've hit my rock bottom. I give up. I quit. I quit the charade. I quit the facade. Come in. Come on in. I can't hold you out anymore. And for us to hear that voice of inclusion and love and compassion and conviction, we too need to be one in our lives that offer that same voice. Because if we listen to the voice of the fox, we give off and emanate the voice of the fox. If we listen to the voice of our Savior, Allah, the mother hen, we give off that voice of compassion and love and grace. All we need to do is look around in the world and know that it's a mess and Jesus continues to weep when we do not encompass that voice. Missiles being launched into Tel Aviv and Jesus weeps. India and Pakistan threatening missile launches against one another and Jesus weeps. The New Zealand mosque shooting now confirmed 50 dead, and Jesus weeps. 19 dead in a cyclone in Mozambique, and Jesus weeps. A shootout with police and a would-be thief at the Bellagio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, and Jesus weeps. A road rage incident in Montana that left a state trooper and several dead, and Jesus weeps. Northeast Nigeria in a refugee camp, a fire killed eight people and left 15,000 without shelter, and Jesus weeps. Flooding in Nebraska and Indonesia, and Jesus weeps. For our Roman Catholic friends in their trials, Jesus weeps. For our Methodist friends who were going and seeking unity in any way possible, Methodist friends, we are with you. Our hearts are broken with you. We have been through this. We pray for you. You are in our hearts. And Jesus weeps. Another town in Nigeria, a building collapsed, killing 20, mostly children. And Jesus weeps. Northern China, seven killed in a mudslide, and Jesus weeps. Friends, I could go on all day. We need to be and embrace that voice of compassion that, not is, that is not a passive one, but an active one, where we seek to follow not the voice of that old fox, but the one of that risen Savior, that same voice that would protect that, the brood of the mother hen. It takes courage for us to stand and be compassionate. It takes faith. It takes a willingness to be rejected, 
a willingness to be seen as people of faith, this is our call. So as we here today in week two of Lent, our challenge is simple. We know that at times we are the voice of the fox and we are the voice of the hen. You are compassionate and loving people. I know because I know you. And I'll speak for myself. I seek to be that as well. And at times I am. But at times I also embrace the voice of that fox that tells me that I have to do more. I have to be more. I have to accumulate more. I have to get this and that and whatever. Because that's what the world tells me. Our goal in Lent is to push back the voice of the fox and enhance and bring in the voice of our risen Savior. So with courage, with our own self-exploration, with the voice of the mother hen, which is the voice of our risen Lord, let us seek that voice that we may show and live his compassion in the world. Hallelujah. Amen.